Ignatius was born into a family of minor nobility in Spain. As a young man, being born into that type of family structure, he was himself very ambitious. He wanted to become a knight, if you will, to be outstanding in the service of the king and country. His approach, therefore, was one of ambition, and through some distant relatives, he was brought to court as a page and gradually began to work his way up the ladder of chivalry. He apparently is only the, the only saint to have a notarized police record for brawling. Um, so he was something of a hothead. In an attempt to distinguish himself so that he would rise further, he came to Pamplona to defend the town against the French who were invading and led this suicidal raid, in effect, that everyone admitted, including the French, was totally futile. He found himself sort of on the parapets of a castle and a cannonball shattered his leg. The French were so impressed with the fight that Ignatius put up at Pamplona that they had their own doctors work on him there before they sent him back home. But they didn't do the best job when he got back home to Loyola. They realized that the way they had kind of set the bone, he was going to walk with a limp. and. He was just, he had too much pride in his appearance and how he was going to come off. And so he submitted himself to a series of operations that were pretty painful just to make his leg look nice in the tights that they used to wear at the time. It was a matter of vanity. They had no anesthetic. There was no way of really diminishing the pain involved. But of course, it protracted his recovery, his convalescence. The sense that I have of Ignatius when he's convalescing at home would be like a kid who has been playing video games all their life and suddenly they don't have access to their Game Boy and what am I going to do to kind of amuse myself? And the only thing they have are these books and it's the life of Christ and another one is the life of the saints. He realized when he was reading this book about the lives of the saints that when he thought about following the lives of uh, St. Francis, St. Saint Saint Dominic and thinking about the Gospels, he would be very excited and afterwards he would still have that feeling of excitement and peace. But when he thought about doing something a little more worldly, while those things made him excited, afterwards he was left feeling a little dry. And so he started to weigh these things and, and thought that maybe that was a way that God was drawing him. And that was the beginning of Ignatian spirituality. He started to think that those different sort of pulls on you, those different kinds of, as he called them, spirits, were ways of discerning God's will in his life. Somehow it stirred some idealism within him and he was led to kind of go on a journey to discover really what it was that he was supposed to be doing with his life. What he decided he wanted to do uh, specifically was to go to the Holy Land and to serve pilgrims there. And so in time he left Loyola, much against his family's wishes. He went to the Benedictine Monastery at the top of the Montserrat Mountains, which are like sawtooth mountains. That's why it's called Montserrat. And there is a beautiful monastery of the Benedictines, and it has as its main piece the Black Madonna. And that night, he spent the whole night kneeling in front of Our Lady's altar, and he presented his sword and left it as an ex voto offering, symbolizing his change of life, that he was now going to devote his life to Christ. When he left the church, he saw a beggar sitting right outside who was in, dressed in rags, and he said to the beggar, I'd like to exchange clothes with you. And he gave the beggar all of his courtly clothes and took the rags the beggar had. And Ignatius started off when there was a big shouting match, etc., and the police came up to him and said, Sir, do you know this man? And they pointed to the beggar who was now dressed in finery. And he said, Yes, and he said, uh, did he steal your clothes? He said, no, I gave them to him. A nobleman who had it all, who gave it all up because he wanted to be in relationship with God and because he was willing to be treated as the teacher treats the schoolboy. After he finishes at Montserrat, he's, he wants to get to the Holy Land. And as he leaves there, he stops in a nearby town with the name of Manresa. He wanted to pray for a bit, and he went to one of the caves and he prayed there, but actually that time stretched out to a year. 
during which time he engaged in prayer and kept notes on his prayer. And those notes became the basis for the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius. Part of the genius of what Ignatius does in the exercises is like, it's one thing to have religious experiences, to have spiritual experiences of God. And people have them all the time. You know, we can have these experiences and then want to tell people what it was like and want to share that. But what Ignatius does is um, he actually figures out a way to help people to have the experience that he had. He comes up with these ways of praying that actually allows them to experience the same thing. First, Ignatius helps us to raise serious questions about you know, what is it that really makes one happy? What, what is God calling me to? Which may be very different from you know, the person who lives next door. He really encourages explicit attention to, you know, what are my desires? What are my hopes? What are the things that really give me problems? When am I really disquieted about something and why? The exercises invite us to become aware of our deepest motivations, the things that give us joy, um, the things that help us meet our own needs. And the idea is that in the process, as we become more fully ourselves, we become more able to give ourselves to others. And one afternoon he went out for a walk and running through the town is a little river called the Cardinaire. He was tired and he sat beside the river, just sort of looking at it. And he said, at that moment, he had an understanding. And the understanding that he came to was that God could be found in all things. That God was not simply found in a church or a monastery or in moments of prayer, but God could be found in the marketplace, among common people, God could be found on the streets, God could be found wherever God's creation existed. He was giving the exercises off and then he would stand on the corners and, and preach to people in different cities in Spain. And of course this was the time when the Inquisition was quite active in Spain and immediately he was suspect. They thought his type of prayer which emphasized um, you know really direct uh, sort of communication between you and God um, was really uh, threatening because you know where's the church and all of this and they so they threw him in jail. He was imprisoned a number of times and examined by people from the Inquisition. And each time they said, we find nothing here that's unorthodox. But as a matter of fact, unless you have a master's degree in theology, you cannot do this. Ignatius was, you know, the, the original adult education person, you know. At the age of 35, he um, is able to kind of swallow that pride of his and sit in a classroom with kids, just suck it up, as it were, to learn the Latin that he needed to learn so that he could go on to school. He began his, you might say, his conversion experience with the idea of abandoning the world and sort of contempt of the world and eventually saw this was not working and that it did not help him and did not help souls. He began to recognize that um, this business of like wearing ratty clothes and growing your hair and your nails long was repulsing people. Um, and so he cleaned himself up. He's in just about all of the universities was what was called the modus italicus. They taught a subject in a three-year cycle. So if you happened to get there when the cycle was beginning, well and good. But if you arrived when they were going into the third year of the cycle and you had no background, you were just tossed into the system, and of course you'd be lost. That was the experience that Ignatius had at the University of Alcalá and at a couple of the other universities in Spain. He heard, however, from some people that there was a totally new approach to education which was being used at the University of Paris. These techniques, which were so fundamental that today we can't imagine education without them, that is to say, uh, students should be divided into classes, they move along progressively, that active participation is essential. And therefore, he goes eventually to the most prestigious uh, academic institution of the day, the University of Paris. So I think what we see in him is a uh, it's a real reconciliation with the world, in a sense, in order to, to help souls better. 
This thought that education was a help was deep in him. I think this is the fundamental background to why and how the society got into education. So part of what Ignatius learns when he's at Paris is a real esteem for what today we would call the classics, the philosophy, the science of people from the ancient world, ancient Greece and ancient Rome, people that certainly in his day would have been called pagans. Yet there was this kind of openness to truth in general that even though this truth might have been first articulated or discovered by people we would consider to be pagans or non-believers, there's something universally true about this and so we can learn from this. One of his roommates is Francis Xavier, you know, who the world would know later as a great saint. And another one is Peter Faber. Ignatius apparently had this incredible ability to make friends. So much so that um, he could get them to consider doing this retreat experience that he had developed. By the time they graduated, there were 10 of them that had all gone through this experience, all of whom had been really changed and affected by it to the point where um, they wanted it to affect the rest of their lives. They make this agreement that they want to get to the Holy Land. They want to do great things for God. At the time, the only way that you could get to the Holy Land was through Venice. So they agree when they're in France that we'll make our way to Venice and we'll give ourselves a year to try to get to the Holy Land. And while we're waiting, we'll do the kinds of things that we want to do anyway, but we'll do where we are. So tutoring kids that need some education, feeding people, preaching, hearing confessions, you know, sacramental kinds of things too. Gradually they started to think that they should start a little religious order. They didn't know what to do. They went to the Pope to say, you know, where should we go? Up to that time, the only form of religious were monastic religious. They lived in a monastery. Their main role was the prayer of the hours. Ignatius said, no, 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 the needs of the people of God are so great that what we want to do is to be available to be of service to others in their needs, bring the good news of the gospel, not only in word but in deed, to them. Initially, there was tremendous opposition to this within the Vatican because they had never heard of religious life other than monastic life. But it was Ignatius's view that God can be found in all things that motivated this. And ultimately, the Pope agreed to allow us to become an apostolic religious community rather than a monastic religious community. And we were the first in the history of the church, the Jesuits were. The thing that he wanted to do is he just wanted everybody to have that experience that he had in the cave, you know. So he did everything he could to spread that to other people, to have them have, to have the direct experience. This educational piece, as we know so well, was not on the radar screen of the Ten Companions. As a matter of fact, they seem to have taken a stance against even teaching the new recruits to the society. But they had learned some pedagogical techniques in Paris. They learned that if they used these techniques with their own members, uh, the young recruits to the society, the young Jesuits, uh, would learn faster. He wanted his Jesuits to be educated in all the things that were important, particularly at the time. So philosophy, uh, fine arts, languages, uh, theology especially. And it's a great example, I think, of, of the seriousness with which Ignatius took the world. Um, it's not a fleeing from the world. They opened the first school because they were asked to do it. They picked up and borrowed these pedagogical techniques and principles known as this Parisian mode. It was a change in direction for them because this meant becoming resident schoolmasters. They did it and they found they were successful at it. We're in a period of extraordinary transition. We're moving these institutions from being primarily Jesuit run to being lay run organizations where most of the faculty are lay people. How do we sustain the charism of these institutions in the absence of a critical mass of members of the Society of Jesus? I don't think any of us have really figured that out. For hundreds of years there's 
uh, been a method to Jesuit education that in its Latin translation was referred to as the Ratio Studiorum, a uh, kind of way of proceeding in Jesuit schools. When there were tons of Jesuits around to teach in the schools, we didn't have to think a whole lot about what it was that we did. As the world and our lives become more and more fragmented, uh, I think we offer something that a lot of other places don't and won't. Uh, if we choose to really, really embrace it. And I'm very hopeful about it. I think it's going to be clumsy and we'll make mistakes and people will ask questions about what we're doing. But I think there is a desire on, on just a tremendous influx of wonderful lay women and men to really be Ignatian. It's now up to us to ensure that this tradition is sustained and has, has an enduring capacity that we all share and that we're all, we all play a role in trying to sustain. And I suggest that in our world, in our time, in our cities, in our departments, in our universities, that we ponder this reality, this tradition, ancient yet ever new, the vocation to educate in the Ignatian tradition.